again, congratulations. I, 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 you know, I followed your career obviously since uh, trading change back in the day, which seems oh long, yeah, but in a minute, eh? yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's an interesting journey that you that you've enjoyed so far. Um, and I remember when when that album came out. Um, obviously, there was I think at that stage there was a, a particular sound that was happening. You know, that uh, call it popular music, call it what you will. And then you appeared, <clears throat> and you were kind of you weren't, you know, you weren't trading on a trend. You know, that in my mind it was a case of you had something to say, and weirdly there was this the genre that had kind of come up that you were able to install yourself in um, and yeah. create a presence for yourself. How, how would you, how would you, I mean, because at the time that you decided to jump in, it was kind of three years into the decision to make this your career, right? Yeah, no, that's well said. And uh, it's, it's insightful because it was, it was a strange, um, it was a weird way that I came into music in the first place and I, I, I hadn't studied music or I didn't have any ambitions to be a musician really up until the age of 24 or something like that. I was late and I'd done all these other things. You know, I'd, um, I'd taken a few years off traveling around the world. I'd done a lot of sailing and into upwards of maybe 50 countries by that stage and done a lot of it backpacking my way around, working in dive bars and on boats and scrubbing billionaires, oligarchs, yachts, and I, I found myself in some pretty interesting uh, places and spaces, as I think many young South Africans do, you know, we're a, we're a gritty bunch, and I was definitely like a gritty young South African who wasn't afraid to go and try and claim some space in the world and have, a, have an adventure, and I didn't have many resources to get me started, so I had to kind of like, I remember that, you know, the way I got over there when I was 18, when I finished high school, was I put my name up at this, the yacht club in Cape Town at the waterfront and I just I still have it to this day it's this really quaint little uh, a picture of myself as an 18 year old Jeremy and it just says like um, looking for any sort of trip um, overseas I didn't even specify where and yeah. uh, you know out there and uh, willing to work uh, day rate 50 rand a day um, and um, not much experience ready to learn and I, I i posted that everywhere i went and stuck it up it was a little pamphlet and that's just like uh it kind of was i i got to see it the other day as i was going through a whole bunch of my old files and throwing some stuff out and i found one of these little things that i'd obviously kept years ago and i it just warmed my heart to know that like that's where it started um with no real plan at all and i i got a call i think it was maybe a month after starting to like distribute these little pamphlets from a captain who was um taking a little 40-foot sailboat from cape town to the caribbean and there were just it was just him and one other crew member so there were three of us and i i said yes and i took this boat shame much to my mom and dads they were t horrified it was like in the middle of hurricane season going into the uh, caribbean and um yeah i didn't have any sailing experience either i mean i just i was a waterman growing up in cape town so i surfed and i felt comfortable on the ocean but i'd never been on a long passage and this passage took us in the end 56 days straight before we hit our first land uh, off the coast of brazil in a little island called fernando de Narona. so um that's how I got started. You know, I kind of missioned around and I did two years of that sailing and working. Then I kind of got this wave of fear and anxiety about what I wanted to do with my life. And I wasn't really sure. So I thought, well, I can't be a young South African out here like working on boats. That's not going to do. So I came back and I went and studied at UCT, you know, and I got I thankfully had decent grades and I was able to get myself into a business degree. I really wanted to kind of have some business acumen and, and um, I, I knew that was maybe a, an important aspect of my life, but I was also really under, under equipped for it because when I did, I, I chose a degree called property development and finance, and I just had no idea how hard it was going to be. And I had to do subjects like accounting and economics and uh, law, four years of law. And I did um, even a subject called financial maths, where they basically cram finance and mathematics into one subject, which is all about learning how to like figure out long term property amortizations and if you want to develop a property how much you'd have to pay banks back and how to take advantage of rates and it was 
so much and I was so ill-equipped for it and I struggled and I, um, I was maybe, you know, I really, I, I wasn't top of the class at all. I was like in the back always hassling just to scrape by and I had to study so hard because I wasn't actually very naturally gifted at any of these things. I was a much more creative kid. I excelled at art. I did drama in school. But the fear of being a young South African without many options kind of drove me to do maybe a more serious business degree almost out of fear, you know, because I think we don't always feel as young South Africans that we have the option to just do music if that's what you feel like. Um, we're almost not allowed, you know, and uh, well, I didn't allow myself. And the repercussion of doing four years of accounting and economics was that I became obsessed with guitar. I picked up a guitar when I was 21 on my second year of university and I didn't put it down. Um, I, I, I must have put in the full 10,000 hours, I would say, in three and a half years. And yeah. I just would get home from university every year, every day. And it was just when YouTube launched and I would just YouTube any tutorial I could find. I think I knew every looping tutorial online. It was maybe in my second, maybe a year of guitar before I found on some obscure YouTube channel, uh, one of the early loop artists, a guy called Andrew Bird. And yeah. uh, I loved what he was doing and I just became obsessed and I, Found, found a loop pedal online, I went and bought it, and then that was it. That was like all I wanted to do was make guitar music and loop, but I wasn't singing. I had no, I'd never sung, I'd never grown up going to singing lessons, I had no idea I could sing, and actually I have quite like a gravelly voice, so I wasn't feeling like I, that was in the stars for me, but I started working on music. And when I finished the degree, I was 24 and I just said to my folks, I was like, well, I was stubborn enough. I did my honors even, I did a thesis. And um, I just said, I'm, I'm kind of done with this. Like, I feel like a lot better. I've got this thing in my hand now. And if I have to come back and try and find a, a day job, like I can, but right now I'm going traveling again. And off I set again for another two years of globe trotting. And I went and worked on yachts again. I took my loop pedal and my guitar and I traveled for another two years. And I wrote so many songs in those two years, um, traveling alone, I had so much alone time. And I got back at the age of 26. I'd earned two years of kind of like yachting money. And I just said to myself, it's now or never. Like um, my options are basically give this music thing a try. And it all started when I got back and started playing just randomly for some of my friends what I'd been doing for the last few years. And none of them had any idea because as far as they were concerned, I was just studying at UCT and now I was doing some traveling. But what I'd actually been doing is having a secret plan and obsessing. And um, people were mesmerized by what I was doing in those early days. And I very shortly after that started busking at the Biscuit Mill. Ooh. I then met my rapper and collaborator, Matteo Moleko, maybe a few months after that, um, playing one of our first shows at Rafiki or some other little bar. A saxophonist got hold of me and said, hey, I saw what you were doing, all that free looping and free jamming. I want to be a part of it. Can I join next week? And I said, yeah, you're welcome. It's an open, it's open mic. Like, you must just, as long as you can keep up with us, you must just join. And that's how it actually all grew. And it was maybe... Yeah, like you said, two and a half years of like busking, playing anywhere, being willing to let anyone jump on stage with me, um, a lot of crowd engagement and learning as I went because I was learning to sing. I was writing songs on the fly and a few of the songs that are, that are still in my set today were actually written live like um, where I didn't have anything else to play and I got to the end of my set and the crowd were all hyped and so I just kind of wildly would start something new and loop them all in and the song that I end my show with see I wrote it for you was was written um, in India at a show where the promoter came on board and uh, on stage when I finished and said you're not finished we've paid you for another 15 minutes you have to keep going and I absolutely shat myself and turned around and went back out there and just started free looping and that free loop turned into a whole thing i looped the crowd in and that became the song see i wrote it for you which is still in my set today as the as the closer so that kind of very organic um like failing forward was the way that i started and then when that first album came I had no idea how to make an album like with trading change I, I didn't have a proper producer on that album I had no real budget to speak of no record label I specifically didn't want to kind of get many partners involved I was like I just need I'm just gonna make 
whatever comes out, you know. And so, I mean, if I look back, there's a lot of things I would change about that first record. But I think I captured a, an innocence and a magic there, which was uh, only able, you're only able to come by that when you really are freewheeling and kind of faking it till you make it in a sense. And as a result, I had no genre. I had no idea what sort of genre I could be. I wasn't following the music scene. I, I didn't know even who Arno Carstens was back then, if I'm honest. Like I wasn't entrenched in the music industry because I had actually been studying finance and traveling the world for four, the other four years. So I had no idea. I think the only band I knew at that time was maybe Hot Water and Freshly Ground were the two that popped up on my radar. And I was like, oh, these guys are kind of cool. Um, and I remember opening for a Hot Water once and having my mind blown. I was like, wow, I'm opening for Hot Water. And, yeah, a few years later, they were all opening for me. It's been, it was just a, a real whirlwind of a, a, of a growth. And uh, yeah, it was very exciting. And that's, and that's pretty much been the theme, um, you know, from pretty much 2014 to today. So, you know, eight years, which again, you know, it, it seems like a long time, but it's not a long time. But now if you, if you go from, from album one to album three, you know, each with four years between them. You, yeah. With this album, you've done the exact opposite. You've invited everyone. Um, and this is, if anything, it's the epitome of collaboration because oh. you've got multiple, multiple players, you've got producers, you've got, it's almost like you said, cool, I'm going to flip it on its head and let's see what happens when we bring everybody in. I was so ready for that. You know, I think the pressure of doing everything on my own was such a, it was a product of necessity when I was coming up and a lack of resources and a lack of opportunity, you know, like we, I had no idea how to get hold of a producer in, in London that had a res, reputable resume. It just wasn't on the cards for me back then. And we had to scrape everything we had together um, in those first years to just produce trading change. Whereas on this record, after hundreds of shows around the world and festival appearances and selling out the Brixton Academy in London, a 5,000 seater, which really garnered like a lot of new attention for us. We were noticed by the industry over there. We were noticed by labels, agents, festivals, and even Ed Sheeran, I think was well aware of us selling out the Brixton Academy. It was part of what he spoke to me about when we first met. So we did a whole, we managed just with a cult following in a way to kind of get ourselves to this level where all of a sudden I could pick up the phone and get hold of almost any producer I wanted and they would at least know enough about me that I could try and, you know, see if they wanted to work together. And we also, you know, I got a, I got a label on board and there was more money involved and uh, I had resources and so it just felt like, why would I do it alone when I could um, actually invite all these people in? And I think also I'm just so aware as I got to peek behind the curtain of what's actually happening out there on the world scene. And I got to start working with some of these A-list writers and producers and being in these studios with amazing gear and stuff we don't have back home. Um, I became aware that it actually really also pushes me forward. You know, if I'm surrounding myself with people at that level, you naturally start to kind of shift into those gears with them um and i needed that so i think like this process of working on this album with everyone really helped me close a bunch of the gaps in my songwriting uh skill set and i truly feel like i got to deliver my best work as a result of being just pushed forward and um held by all these incredible artists and musicians who touched the project in little ways Jerry, what, what's the catalyst for you to pick up the phone and speak to whoever it is that you want to speak to? What, I mean, obviously each one is, is unique, but um, you know, to be brave enough, pick up the phone and pitch basically. Um, but obviously there's something about that producer, something about that artist, <clears throat> whether it's Ed, whether it's whoever it was, um, for you to go, I think that if we bring our two worlds together, something magic can happen. Yeah, it's a good question. I think, like you said, it's it's definitely um, it's a it's a song dependent thing. So like the the collaboration with Ladysmith, Black Mombazo, uh, I've always dreamed of working with them. I went and watched them during the South African World Cup, and I spent basically the entire show crying because it meant so much to me to see one of the few bands that I did know from a childhood point of view. Um, 
performing songs that like just move me to tears and so they've always been up there and I always kind of dreamed of it but never knew how to figure it out and then I wrote this song and the song I didn't know how to finish it I've got lots of unfinished songs but this one in particular just had like a a groove and a feel to it that I I felt like if there was ever a song I've written that could go that way it was that and so I sent them a long email with the song attached and just kind of motivating to them why I'd like to work with them and what the song was about and just seeing what their time was like and so that was very specific to that song and they were very keen on working on the track which was great and yeah, being in studio with them and working on that song was just such a unique experience and yeah seeing guys like that who've been doing it since the late 60s just blew yeah. my mind you know there's this and I think and the video does it so much justice because when you yeah. watch yeah, you you get a sense of the love and respect um, that that clearly each of you have for one another. And I think for them it was a joy because it was uh, it, it injected a whole new energy into you know as you say into what they've been doing for an extended period of time. Yeah, and like you say, they were. Yeah, maybe not on people's radar like that anymore. And so it was, I think for them, exciting to be doing like a, a, a big music video. You know, they hadn't done something like that in a long time. And um, I think they also saw it as like a passing of the baton, you know, like they, they've they been uh, struggle icons, you know, in their own way. They've been singing revolution songs for as long as any other band ever and right through South Africa's most tumultuous times. And in my own way, I'd like to think that I've been doing a, a similar thing, may, albeit in a different time and maybe um, a different context, but certainly with the same intention behind what I'm trying to do and the messages I'm trying to um, solicit out there. And I think they saw that about me quite quickly and um, a, a few of them in the choir were, were quite aware of who I was anyways. And I think there was a, a common thread of like unashamed, unashamedly going after joy and um being bold enough to uh yeah to unashamedly do those sorts of songs in a world where sometimes that stuff isn't as cool as making you know cooler music and they didn't have any of that going on and neither do i uh, we really saw eye to eye creatively and i think that was what was lovely and yeah albert mazabuko was just passing me words of wisdom the whole time we were together he he's like must be 80 years old now he's been one of the original founders and he he said some really beautiful things to me, which I, we, I, we can't, maybe don't have scope to go into, but I was just astounded by the, the grace and willingness to kind of pass that baton on. And they kept calling me on the set Youngblood. And I was like, I'm not Youngblood at all. I've been doing this as far as a South African artist goes. My career has been about as long as you normally can go in this country uh, before you get flushed out. Um, and uh, but to them, I truly am just like young blood, still starting out, and it, it motivated me in a way to remember that this whole idea of like shining so bright and then going out on top, which seems to be quite a theme in the music world. People want to like go out before they start falling down, is like the most irrelevant thing to me in the world. I just looked at their journey and thought like the real journey in this craft is to figure out how to stay around not necessarily even stay relevant but stay enjoying what you were like almost made to do this vocation that in some ways chose me it felt like and i've had to fight for um i'd love to keep going and making songs until i'm 80 years old like albert and being able to inspire young artists who are coming up through the ranks with uh, words words of wisdom the way he was inspiring me so yeah, I mean, the, that, that, that collaboration came totally organically. The thing with Ed was really organic as well. We, we met each other, we drank together, we laughed together, we had this long conversation and he said we should write together. And I was like, whatever, dude, like you don't have, just because we're getting drunk together and having the best time, you don't have to pretend you, you want to work with me. Like I'm well aware of the fact that you're the biggest artist in the world right now by some distance. Um, and you have bigger fish to fry, but I appreciate the gesture. And he was like, oh man, I wouldn't say it if I wasn't serious. I'd, I'd love to work together. And I was like, all right, well, you call me if you want to. And of course I didn't hear from him for months and my manager was heckling me and saying, you've got to get hold of him. Like, when are you going to write to him? And I just said, 
I'm never going to write to him. Like, you don't chase Ed Sheeran. Like, he said he wants to write, so let him come to me if he wants to. And otherwise, let's just be grateful that I met the guy. It's a great connection to have, and I've got his number, and maybe one day we'll connect. Anyways, I was glad I stuck to those guns because about six months later, he did get hold of me, and I ended up flying over to London to go work with him in his home studio. So, and yeah, the, as far as the other producers, I kind of picked some of them based on songs that I really like. So one of the guys was the guy who produced the first two Lumineers records, um, a guy called Simone Felice. He's from New York, and I loved those first two records by the Lumineers. I thought they were just like groundbreaking for their time and recorded so beautifully with so much soul. And so I, yeah, we, we, I just wrote to him and we got him on board and you go through a process of sending him a few of the songs that you are wanting to develop and they kind of, he'll listen and give you feedback and say, yeah, I, I really like this. I'd love to work on this song with you. And that's how it happened with him. And similarly, the other artists, I, I went in, some of them I went in blind, like Egg White um, was one of the producers I loved working with and he's a very charming, crazy dude. He's the guy who's famous for do, uh, doing a lot of the Adele uh, records. And um, I was very unsure how our kind of styles, given what he'd done with Adele, might gel together. But we ended up writing one of the most up-tempo bangers on the album, a song called Happy Birthday. So, yeah, I also learned that you mustn't have, you know, in this industry too many preconceived ideas. Like, artists and people that you work with in this space are able to do just about anything and it's just about where I will want to push it with them and um, yeah, yeah I think going forward I'll be a lot more open to this sort of collaboration yeah I mean I think there's there's two points to that you know and it's a I've, I've applied it in my own life is that if you don't ask you don't get so that's the first thing for sure the, the second point is I want to read the emails that you send to these people because clearly you have a writing skill that basically appeals to them to the point that they go I'm going to pick up the phone and actually speak to Jeremy because yeah. You know, I'm crying into my face right now because, you know, the, the sincerity, but I think above everything, when I, when I think of Jeremy Loops, I think of authenticity. I think of somebody who's going, look, left or right, I'm going to do what I feel is right, but I'm, I'm coming from a place of mutual respect for whoever it is that I'm engaging with, audience or player. For sure. No, you're right. I, um, I've always been really easy on myself. And I've always been really easy on others. And sometimes it's to my detriment. And just what I mean by that is like, uh, I think I've been really aware really, of people are flawed, you know, like we're all so flawed. And some of my most beautiful interactions in my life have been with some of the most flawed people I've ever met, you know. And if I was, I'm so glad that I've always had that perspective that I'm willing to engage with someone on the levels that are authentic to me with that person and not look the other way necessarily about like the sides of them that I don't agree with, but just be easy on them and recognize that like within myself, I also have these beautiful attributes uh, that people seem to adore and that have got me all this way. And then I've got all this other stuff that's like can be toxic and can be stuff that I'm sharing and learning to, um, yeah, just be really okay with everything that I am and just do the best that I can and then try to not expect other people to be saints uh, or have high expectations. I, think I really aspire to keep that strong. Yeah, and I think missed opportunity because I think if you shut yourself down um, because you just don't know what's around the corner. But I know that we've got three minutes left, Jeremy. So I just wanted to wrap up with, obviously, you... I'm not in a rush, to, but don't worry about me. But yeah, okay, the, cool. but you, take as long as you want. But yeah, let's go. Okay. You, you're about to embark on <clears throat> what seems like the rest of the year. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you started touring internationally, you know, very soon after Trading Change happened. And that's been kind of the theme ever since so you clearly this is a comfortable space that you're in you love to tour but i think the question really is around you know how important is this album for you i think from a live perspective <clears throat> to grow that audience and to grow the reach that you've got and to touch more people um because th this tour is a, is a big one i mean and it's it's all over the show yeah, I mean, if anything, I'm worried I've got a little bit soft after two and a half years of chilling and being a little bit more home-based, you know, working on this album over such a long period of time was 
while it was uh, quite difficult to stay focused um, over the you know over this whole lockdown, it was yeah it offered me such a nice opportunity, some respite from global touring, and I got to double down on my friend circle and reestablish myself and not always be the guy who's just not invited to weddings or anything because I'm not around and people just think I'm not available. Mm-hmm. It was nice to kind of re-ingrain myself with all my best friends and spend more time in the ocean and um, more time with my girlfriend and more time with my dog and my family. And uh, there was a lot of a lot of stuff that I think I've become acquainted, like uh, yeah, reacquainted with. That I think is going to be difficult for me this time around to leave behind. I leave tomorrow. I'm uh, obviously on my second day of press and promo today in Joburg but tomorrow we fly out for the beginning of what like you say becomes basically three months on the road um, 30 40 cities we're going to be in and many many shows and many miles traveled and lots of adrenaline adrenal fatigue and burnout and cortisol dumps like I'm ready for it all but um, I'm also like uh, acutely aware that I think the, the difference this time around is that with the space that the lockdown brought for me, I, I've re, I've kind of re, rebalanced the, and recalibrated how I wanted to live my life. And I think the way that I was working and the way that I was willing to hustle so hard, it was, um, yeah, it was the perfect time in my life. It was the, the 26 to 36 years. And I started late. I felt like I had catching up to do, and I was willing to break myself to do it. And I've just popped through that. I'm on the other side down away, and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm now eyeing out the next stage of my life, and I don't think the next stage of my life needs to be as intense. Uh, I'm also um, concerned about the prospect of getting much bigger as an artist. You know, like if this record really were to blow up internationally we became a household name in the uk and europe um i'm not sure if that's necessarily what i want like the space we're in now where we play 2000 3000 seat venues in each city that's a great space to be in you know we make enough money uh, i can pay the band we can travel in style in a big tour bus we get all the luxuries but i'm not getting hunted down by paparazzi you know like just working with ed i could see the toll that it takes living that life and i've got no aspiration for that level of success um, or that level of like worldwide publicity it's um, I think the the cost becomes too high and I actually think the space I'm moving into now is a, a beautiful happy medium where, where uh, I'm established enough to do what I do and make the records I love and I've got a lot of people who listen to that music and get a lot of value out of it and if I can just continue to build on this at a at a rate that I can maintain longer term, I think I would far prefer that than um, burning out and flying too close to the sun, which is what I think I see a lot of a lot of that happening to those A-listers who who go all the way and there's no real way back, you know. And I just saw like recently Justin Bieber's face got paralyzed from anxiety and stress. I don't know if you saw that. Um, I had a friend who that happened to once, so uh, from anxiety and stress. And I just thought like, of course. Justin Bieber is going to have his face melt from like the yeah. difficulty of it all. Like how else can someone live in the limelight like that and have no privacy and have no sanctity uh, and space? I, I, I don't, I don't crave that stuff. So I think I'm actually, I've lowered my expectations for the album. And if it does something amazing, like, yeah, we're going to follow it down, but I think I'm going to be following it down in a much more measured way. And, I'm going to tour it, but I'm not going to be going back to those markets three or four times a year and touring for eight months of the year like I used to. Those yeah. days, to some extent, are behind me, and I'm uh, I'm looking now to see how can I start to send other young South African artists down the road that I've built overseas. Yeah. You know, like that's really the goal, and I think that's going to give me a lot more, um, yeah, a lot more purpose and internal satisfaction long term if I can start like helping people walk the road that I've been building with my team. And you, and you understand that. I think, I mean, that talks to perpetual evolution, which clearly, like for you, going into this stage, you know, touring a new album, album, you know, the tracks are finished, you've got a lot of unfinished work, as you say, that you haven't released yet. So for you, this is kind of an exploratory journey to see where the next chapter will take you. 
Absolutely, yeah. No, I'm, I'm trying to really uh, distance myself from the expectations of what I needed to achieve and just kind of being more interested to see which songs of these new things that I've been working on really connect with people. There's obviously some songs on this record where I've stepped a little bit outside of just like the folky, rootsy space and tried to bring some more like modern sounds into it. Uh, use, use some amazing drummers on some of these tracks and almost brought like some of these very popular like Anderson Park like rap style drums I was I was experimenting you know and moving outside of what I'm used to and uh, my hope is that people love it as much as I do but if they don't I'm not bothered yeah but I mean it, it, I think it's great you know it's a case of um, you're able to be a little bit more playful and it sounds to me like you're actually enjoying a journey that you know with a you know your Ed Sheeran or you know, anyone else for that matter they get so swept up in it that they kind of lose touch with the very thing that they chose to get into in the first place so um I'm, I'm excited for you and I and I think your your are your thinking um is is sobering because I think it's going to save you from that ever happening to you but I think it's all about sure. enjoyment, right? You want to have as much fun as the fans. Uh, I actually, I, I was on radio this morning and we were speaking about something and I just actually asked them if I was allowed to read a message out to everyone listening on air on 947 here, um, which was from one of my audience uh, community members. And it was just this beautifully vulnerable, deep message that someone had sent me about their road to recovery from addiction and how my song man didn't just play like a pivot two weeks ago um, he just broke down in tears and no one could console him he said his wife didn't know what was going on and he said as he was crying in the crowd like at this live concert listening to mortal man play and hearing the crowd sing it he realized that this was the first time he was able to feel the full weight of the achievement that he had made in overcoming his addiction and he was now five years sober and mortal man has been a song that's been soundtracking his sobriety for the last year and a half since it's come out and anyways he wrote me this long message and i said to him do you mind if i share it and he said no you're welcome to and the the video i put out today on my instagram was just a, a thing i recorded last night where i just read the message to my whole community and reminded them like I'm reading you this not because I want you to hear how much my music means to some people so that that's in any way like boasting. Um, I want you to know that I see all these messages and I might not be able to get back to you all but I'm seeing just about everything um, that comes across my social media and so if you want to send me messages like this just know that I'm this is the stuff that drives me forward like this is the stuff that keeps me on my path because this world of like power and fame and money and all the things that have come with my success um, it's what people don't understand a lot of the time is that it's a double-edged sword you know it's got for all of those positives and all of that power there's this dark side on the other side of the sword which um, can immediately corrupt you and, and take you into a world of pain and unbalance and it happens all the time I'm acutely aware of it and I feel the pull in my own life and I've slipped onto that side of the sword many a time myself so um, I I put it out to just remind all of them that these messages is, is what helps me kind of like keep my arrow straight and I, I was asking people to send them you know like send me those messages so that I can receive the joy that my music is bringing you so that I might continue to like be happy in what I'm doing and be like unfazed by all the noise that comes uh, with this yeah difficult uh, vocation that I've chosen yeah. well, that yeah. might have chosen me <laughs> exactly I think it, music does choose you um, but Jeremy thank you we could talk for days um, but I Lovely. think uh, thank you I heard you got love and clearly you've got a lot of love um, and um, it's, it's reciprocal, I think. On, and that's where the fuel, that's where the fuel is for for your fans and for yourself. So I wish you all the best with the tour. Enjoy every minute. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I yeah, I will. Yeah, I appreciate it. Let's do this again sometime in the future. Maybe when you've had a good time, chance to listen to it all, and maybe it's out. We'll do a little post uh, post tour roundup. 
But yeah, I appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks again.